Roto Ballers, we are back for the Texas Children's Houston Open. My main man, a.k.a. T of Sports, a.k.a. Spencer Aguiar, a.k.a. The Drip Machine, to my left-hand side of you, joins me once again for the Roto Baller PGA Show. What's cooking on this fine Monday evening, Spencer? Impressive getting that name out as cleanly as you did, Byron. That's... Uh... You're in tip-top form to begin this on a Monday. Got to got to rattle it off early before your mouth gets lazy and and kind of in the mood to just kind of make some mistakes. But we got ourselves a mouthful. We got about as many words as we do like elite golfers playing this week, which is okay. You know, we had the Valspar last week with old Peter Malnati. We can chat about that for a second. But I think you know everyone's trying to really just create Spencer the players once more. The reason. You you can't enjoy the you can't enjoy the lights you can't enjoy the brightness you can't enjoy the shine without the darkness you got to have disaster you got to have despair you got to have the yin and the yang and I think you know when you have the the tournaments like the Valspar where the likes like Justin Thomas crowd favorites did not enjoy the limelight of the Valspar let's be honest like we've had Jordan Spieth not want to win that tournament JT now Keith Mitchell we got to enjoy those like the Valspar. You know, the the gray, the gloomy, so be it. It is what it is. It makes the weekends, the weeks like when Scotty Scheffler wins, when Sam Burns wins, you know, all that, that much more enjoyable. So I don't know. Do you have a, a particular take on that? I mean, kind of. I'm probably in the minority with this answer um, because everybody does want to see all the top players going head to head every week. But I think that's what makes golf fun. And and it's, it's those storylines of a Peter Malnati that can go – countless years without winning and all of a sudden he gets himself back into the winner's circle it's these you know tournaments with a cut where there's an ability to have real storylines that are written on friday and then continuous storylines that are written on sunday so um you know i think the average fan yeah there's some nature that you lose a lot of players to live and you want this to be scotty scheffler versus rory mcelroy down the stretch and while that's a lot of fun i, I still think that equally on the opposite end of the spectrum there for golf to thrive, you need the, the second tier guides, the, the guys that are barely keeping their card. Like Joel Damon has become a fan favorite in a lot of ways, like whether it's because of the reality shows that they have put him on on Netflix yeah. or his personality that he brings to the table, he's relatable. And I think that relatability that, that certain of these guys can have when, they are struggling to make cuts. They're struggling to make a living. This is not as simple as Scheffler putting together 8.5 million in the span yeah. of two weeks, which yeah. congratulations to Scotty Scheffler for being the best golfer at this current time. But there's a lot more that goes into golf than that. And, and I think that even just on top of it, it's really difficult to win a golf tournament, Byron. Um, you don't have to look any further than Cameron Young. Like how many times can we get into contention with him and he doesn't actually get across the finish line? And I think that makes it to when Scotty Scheffler does win these events. It's, it's that much more impressive because it's not that easy to go out and win every event. And you see sports books this week with Scotty at three to one. And I understand why he's priced the way that he is. My mall had him number one across the board in every single metric that I've ran. I've never had that for a golfer in a tournament before, but it's still challenging to win. He could come in second place and have yes. whoever it is. Wyndham Clark could shoot around. You could have one of these guys further down the board. So that is what makes golf fun is the storyline. So I thought the Valspar was a nice tournament. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that's like if Peter Malnati has won, golf is ruined. The PGA Tour is ruined as, as we know it. But I, I I don't agree with that take. No, no. I enjoyed watching. I en I enjoyed watching Peter Malnati try win a golf tournament. You know, like Spencer, you make, Scotty makes it win. Scotty's winning. He makes it look so easy. You know, the way he can just control his golf ball, it just teleports from point A to point B. Peter Malnati's teleport, it's like, it's, it doesn't quite go off according to plan. You know, like he teleports. Ball's then, even the wrong color. Like everything <laughs> is wrong. The wrong color. He doesn't wear the right hat. <laughs> yeah. You know, like everything about him, it just doesn't make any sense. I love it. You know, so we need characters like that. And, you know, the, the interview afterwards is also obviously lots of fun to kind of, you know, see the emotion and everything behind there. But it's good. It's good. Justin Thomas just ejected himself out of that tournament. <laughs> so hard, Spence. The guy lost, what, like eight strokes putting in one round of golf. I think it's one of the, I think it's his worst performance of putting ever. 
It's like, tell me you don't want to be at the dance without telling me you don't want to be at the dance. There were a lot of weird performances last week. That's clearly the strangest one on the putting greens that he put together. But I mean, there were there were some awkward returns and there's a lot of chalk that ended up missing the cut when we look oh at God. Sam Burns and Brian Harmon. Brian Harmon. And I mean, I fell into the Aaron Rye trap. So there, there were a lot of names that didn't get through. And then, uh, I mean, there were at portions of that leaderboard on Sunday where I mean, it was everybody that is who you were not expecting to be up there. And I think, you know, at the end, Mel Naughty winning, it makes it a little bit weirder. But I think if you just look at the leaderboard at the end, Xander's up there, Cameron Young's up there. It's a lot of players you would expect, but like Xander never had a chance. It was one of those classic backdoor out of nowhere. Here comes Xander storming up the leaderboard. You know, somebody needs to work with Xander. I don't know if he has a sports psychologist, but he needs to be hypnotized. Like before yeah. some of his rounds when he has the lead on Sunday, just tell him he's going out. He's 10 shots back. He has no Saturday chance to morning. actually win this thing. Yeah. I, it's, I don't understand what's wrong with him. And I don't understand what's wrong with Cameron Young. It's like the same answers with a lot of these guys to where um, winning golf tournaments is difficult, but they make it even more challenging on themselves for whatever reason. And I, I didn't love Cameron Young's demeanor, even when he lost. Like he's almost reached the point right now where he's just he's like, accepted. Yeah. He's like, I know he's it's going to happen. Who cares yeah. at this point? Yes. He has. He's gone full submissive mode and it's <laughs> he's never holding a whip ever again, I would say. You know, like it's it's not good for Cam Young unless it's a major. I think he's first, he's gonna be one of these guys, Spencer, who just wins majors. Like he's gonna go Brooks, but like way harder version of that. Like three wins in his career, two US opens and a PGA championship. Yeah. You know, like that's gonna be his his resume. And so be it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. He just tends to play better in those situations. He just, like, he hit the most miraculous recovery shot and then three putts it. Like, the first putt wasn't even close. It's just, he just gave up, you know. So, it was there, but hey, it is what it is. So, let's let's chat some golf here, Spence. And before we dive into it, I have some trivia for you about the Memorial Golf Course, the Memorial right. Park Golf Course at the Texas Children's Houston Open. So we've got that going for us there. So Spencer, tell me who's shot the worst. We've played here for three years in November. The prevailing winds haven't necessarily eclipsed, you know, 10, six miles an hour. You know, there's been two days. What is the worst score being shot and who shot it at this golf course? Three years. So I went to my course history just to see what some of the scores were that players have actually produced like the worst total that I can see on the board, unless I'm missing somebody would be Bo Hostler or Grayson Murray at 17 over par the first year. So I guess based off of that answer and if I'll say Grayson Murray, yes. What a Grayson Murray shoot. Well, I'll tell you now he lost 12.7 strokes to the field shooting in 85. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I was assuming it would be in the eighties based off of, there was probably one of those rounds that was like yeah. 81, 82, 85 is even worse than that. 85 for those of you not paying attention is 15 over par at this golf course. Yeah. So <laughs> brutal times over there. It's essentially an 88 or 87. So tough scenes. And then we've got two guys, Spencer, both have shot what I believe is the course record. Yeah. I don't know. A 62 in the three years that have been played. Who are they? Or at least I'll, ass one. I'll assume one is Finau because he's 16 under par with the win. So I, I assume he probably got up there. I, I mean, I don't know if this is the correct answer. Um, don't ever think it. It's, I'll it's say Carlos awesome. Ortiz. I'll say it's the two winners that have Yeah, it's, won. it's him or Scotty Scheffler. So Scotty shot a 62, I think, after barely making the cut, you know, in 2022, I think. So um, Scheffler has gained nine strokes in that round for the 62, and then Finau gained eight, which is quite crazy to think. You know, so between... Grayson Murray and, and Scotty Scheffler's two rounds that we got casual 20.8 <laughs> strokes between the two rounds of golf. So fun stuff going on over there. Let's chat about Scotty Scheffler. I think from what I can see in the last three years, at least no one's been priced $13,000 outside of golfers playing the tour championship. Scotty has been priced at 13 K flat. Awesome. This is what we're looking for. We're not looking for people to just dump 60% of their salary or their exposure onto Scotty, call it a day, and then and roll on. Like, we need 
some sort of payoff, you know, like trade off that you need for a golfer that's this good. So finally getting a thirteen thousand dollar golfer Spence, talk to me about Scotty Sheffield at the top of the board, yeah. What do you think his ownership will end up being? Um, that's that's to me is one of the question marks here. I, I to me, and maybe I'm wrong here. I think he'll probably still sneak into the thirty percent plus range, um, yes. somewhere between thirty yeah. to. 38%. That's a very large range there that would be given. I'll let you answer that question and then I'll, I'll talk about Scotty a little bit. Yeah. I would say he, he's going to be 30%. I feel like it's a three to one. Uh, it's tough. It's tough to, you know, like people are going to fall into that trap so we can chat, but we've seen, you know, if it wasn't for that course record round or for the 62, doesn't necessarily play the best golf at this golf course. So I don't know, Spencer, what, um, what are your thoughts on Scotty? I think the problem with this board in general, and this was kind of one of the first things I noticed. So like I'll answer it as a DFS question. And then I'll also talk about it in the betting board of this being three to one and kind of some of the situations that came into play. I talked about this at the beginning. Scotty is the only golfer that has ever for me been number one in every single category that I've run. Like number one in expected weighted T to green, number one in expected strokes gain total. He's number one on long par 70s. He's number one on hard courses. He put together the number one score for me in weighted scoring. He was number one in, uh, I would call it another additional scoring category. It took pretty or better bogey avoidance. A couple other categories. Number two for weighted proximity. That was the one category I did not run. It went into the strokes gain total aspect of it. But uh, Tom Hoagie was number one there. And that's kind of oh, the, the answer. What Hoagie's been doing. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Like, it's really hard for me to not want to play Scotty Scheffler. I thought at the players, even though he ended up going to win the tournament, that was a highly volatile course where you've seen guys go win, miss cut, second, miss cut. And it seemed like it was possible that Scotty could put together a similar sort of trajectory. I think we've seen with his ball striking that Scotty is not like every other player on tour right now. He may not be peak Tiger Woods of what we got years ago, but you know, he's the closest thing that we've had to him, even if it's like a stroke difference in uh, expected strokes gain total that he's putting together. So I like that he's $13,000. I think pricing is very soft at the bottom, which makes it more conducive to actually build lineups with him. I thought pricing in general was pretty stout across the board. I thought where the problems came into play were more at the bottom to where I could find you know, five to 10 guys that were like $6,000 or less that were playable commodities for me. So I thought that made him very enticing to put into lineups if he's only 30%. Um, I think part of the problem with that is, and I'd like to get your opinion on this in a second, but take Wyndham, take Sahith, take Will Zalatorx, take Finau. That's the top five of my model in the exact order that they were priced out. So I don't think that there's any mistakes that were made. And that's kind of what makes these DFS boards difficult sometimes. Before you touch on that, do want to very quickly mention the outright board of him being three to one. Whether or not you believe that's the right answer there, and we could have that discussion at a different time. Yeah. My biggest concern with this board is that sportsbooks made Scotty Shuffler three to one. And then decided to do nothing about everybody else's total. And you've put Wyndham at 12 and you've put, you know, this player at 18 and that player at 22. And I, you've ruined the value on the board. Like you've kind of said, these are the five or six favorites or the sports books have said, these are the five or six favorites. If you want to bet them at a bad price, have at it. That's going to probably be who wins this golf contest, but you're not going to get value on this board. And I hate this tournament from an outright betting perspective. Like if you look at my card and it's in my rotable article, it's essentially 300 to one long shots where I'm just randomly throwing flyers out there and hoping that something sticks. I, I kind of think that the winner is probably one of those five names I said, even if it's not Scotty. So I, I just, I hate the way that this tournament's priced. Yeah. You were mentioning before we went live that this is the, one of the worst odds boards you've ever seen. I, I think so you is. did a pretty good job of not really letting that come <laughs> that across Spence. <clears throat> I, I sat this morning, just woke up. Staring at the odds board, just don't know. I don't know what to do. Usually I've got a, an area, a plan, and a track strategy. No. This week, just sat there and I'm like, oh, would bet this guy if he was like double those odds. I'd bet this guy if he was six points more. So sitting here, I've only made one bet, Spence. So we'll get to that down the down the stretch here. But to me, again, I think this week I'm gonna I'm gonna leave Scotty alone. 
it was working pretty nicely with Xander last week. You know, when you get these 30% guys that are that high, I mean, 13K is, you got to figure out some serious stuff going on down there. And I think I'm okay just taking my, I'm not that good of a DFS player to figure out who the other five guys are going to be that's going to be with Scotty Scheffler. So do you play Scotty Scheffler in single entry, Spencer, or are you playing him in, in 150 maxes? I mean, to be honest with you, and maybe this, because I, I think in theory, if you look at this and let's just use 150 entries as the answer here, because I think in in single entries, he's a lot easier to play. Like that's just the natural answer that's going to come into play. I think in 150 man, in general, if you did nothing throughout your entire DFS life, other than fade 30% plus golfers, you would be more advantageous taking that route than randomly sneaking them into builds. I think from a game theory perspective, you want to try to eliminate as many people as you possibly can. I, I just worry that even if Scotty doesn't end up winning, and it kind of goes back to the answer that I gave, that I do think that pricing, even like 7,000 and below, there's a lot of ways to fit in names that I really like this week that I thought should have been much more expensive. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of ownership around a lot of these names. Like you will have a few where there's ownership, like an Andrew Novak is going to carry a lot of popularity this week. And my model liked him also, but there were guys at the very bottom, whether that's a Geyserman or a, a Bridgman or any of those names that I think they're going to be sub 5% that my model is so much higher on them than public perception that I'm kind of just rolling with Scotty and not making the same mistake that I necessarily usually make in this spot. Hey, you know, that's the thing. It's you got to figure out your strategy and go from there because it's a conundrum. It's and it's a very, it's a very counterintuitive answer of what I normally get. You never hear, like, I think it is very rare that you hear me go on a show and not try to find every reason to avoid chalk on the board. I, I'm always yes. the person that's like, He's over whatever percent I'm out. And like, that's the very natural answer in a lot of these spots. But I, I don't know, Byron. I just think Scotty. He's becoming a wide receiver one. You know, yeah. like in NFL DFS, you can tell who the chalk wide receivers are and they produce, right? Where Scotty, he's just, it's all about the price now because he's, his top five, top 10 market is absolutely nuked. I've been betting <laughs> that religiously you know at minus 140 for a top 10 minus 275 for a top 10 this week i mean there are markets out 10. there there's markets out there where it's scotty versus the field and you can get the field at like minus 325 or minus 350 <laughs> that's i mean we haven't hit a ball yet it's kind of just i mean whether it's just unbelievable what scotty has put together and it's still difficult to win a golf tournament i'm not coming on here saying that scotty's going to necessarily win this event i think Three to one is probably closer than most people actually believe it to be. Um, I, I'm not going to bet him at that price. The exposure that you would have to get to get a, a ticket down there is just not within what I want to do with my bankroll. But at thirteen thousand dollars, I can get my exposure that way and be just perfectly fine. Yes, I think that's the way to go, Spence. Because then you've got to figure out the other five guys and rock and roll. So Scotty's likely going to be inside the top ten, and that's you know a good chance is going to be part of the optimal, but at 13K, who the heck knows what that's going to be, right? I mean, it provides fascinating fantasy play, you know, and I think that's what we're looking for. We're looking for challenging environments, especially with this 5K range. I think they've been loosening us up for this big drop. So we've got a bunch of jabronis here in the 10K range, you know, casual $2,100 off Scotty Scheffler with Wyndham Clark at 10.9, Willie Z rounding out at 10.1. I am eyeing out Seth the Gala. I've already bet him. 20, 22 to one. He's just been playing too good. He leads into this week, you know, two top tens. I think he played quite nicely when he did play. He's driving the ball great. He's just my guy. I think I'm just going with the guys I've been on the whole time. 22 to one is disgusting. I've been betting Sahith at like 50s, you know, the last little while. But again, this, if you look at the rest of the names below him, it's like, okay. I know Sahith can win a golf tournament. I've not seen him go full Keith Mitchell and and finish 17th after leading off with about two strokes entering the final round. You know, like he's gonna hang at least, you know. And winning golf tournaments is tough. And he can he can do it. He's got the mental capacity to to at least lose it on the final hole and not lose it before he stepped out of bed, you know, that morning. So that to me is exciting about him. Give me him 22 to one. And then 
I haven't placed the bet yet, Spencer, but I'm kind of curious about Wolves Alatoris. I've been placing bets on him pretty much. I was taking a shower and thinking, you know how good his agent has been since coming back? Outside of the Sony, every other tournament has just been amazing for him. You know, the farmers, the the big boy tournaments, you know, just all these all these events, API, you know, all these courses that suit how he plays. And then he obviously made it into the players and missed the cut. It's perfect. So this golf course, again, another long ass t- golf course. Not a lot of scoring. You know, we're going to expect, what do you expect this course the, to play at, Spencer? Minus 10? I, I'm going to go. Gonna be more difficult. I'm going to go. I've kind of changed. I, I'm going to go a little bit easier than that. Uh, my reason for that is I think the time change from November to March, I think one of two things happens here, and this is where it becomes challenging to figure out. You now get this dormant Bermuda. It's going to be overseeded. You get softer landing areas. I think that could make scoring a little bit easier. I also think that there's a chance that you might get a little bit heavier winds during this time of the month. Yes. So, uh, you know, it's a give and take here. Does the wind outweigh the softer conditions? Does the softer conditions make the wind not necessarily matter as much. I don't I don't necessarily think that this is going to be some very difficult course or a birdie fest at the end of the day. I, the PGA Tour consistently keeps trying to put us in these spots, and I think it took some weather last week for that to probably become a little bit softer yeah. or a little bit easier, I should say, than we've been – like a little bit harder than we've been getting, sorry, uh, over the past little bit, but – I don't know, Byron. I have a feeling that this course might end up creeping out a little bit more into like the 14, 15, 16, 17 under sort of range, which changes the outlook quite a bit. Yes. And that's something I wanted to mention about last week is I placed that Sam Burns bet thinking, okay, let's go get to 18 under par. Let's do this thing again. I didn't even look at the weather Monday morning, which should have, I should have. And that plays a big role. Sam Burns was never going to win that tournament finishing at minus 12. You know, like I just thought it was going to be a different situation. Land up missing the cut. So I think that makes a big role, Spence. And I think from what I looked at, the prevailing winds in November don't really make it much more than 10 miles per hour. And then the winds expected this week are sitting at like 12. So we're going to see a bit more wind this week, in my opinion. Keith Stewart was saying that the, the new grass can make it allow the ball to get to where they want the ball to roll to this the time round. You know, November wasn't allowing them to get the grass growing the way they want to kind of, you know, get the overseas maneuver, maneuvering balls further to the runoff areas. This this time round, we could expect that. So I have no freaking idea. We'll, we'll have to wait and see and see what happens. But um, I mean, on those two guys, I think Willie Z's got a chance to win any golf tournament when the moment – the score is between minus eight and minus 14. You know, like I think once it gets a bit higher than that, he struggles to get all the way up there with the birdie. So which, uh, which of those two are you, are you favoring? I'm, I'm kind of out on Wyndham Clark just because of his price tag Spence. you know, at an outright perspective, at least. Yeah. I, I also think the ownership, um, I mean, it'll remains to be seen right now, but I, I think Wyndham's going to be very popular. Um, yeah. My mentality for the most part, because even when you throw Scotty into a build, like if you throw Scotty in Finau, you have 67, 75 left. And while that doesn't seem like much, all of a sudden, 5,100, you back in. You, you throw in a Bridgman at 55, you're up to 72, you throw in somebody else lower, and yeah. y- you can work your way back up. And this isn't as like boom or bust of a lineup as you would expect it to be. But um, I think ownership is going to be a very big decider here of how I'm going to look between the Clark, the Gala, Zalatoris female section there specifically if I am going to play Scotty Scheffler at the top one of the things I've always noticed about Sahit Tagala and I, I found this at at the Fortinet when he won that tournament any time that he has positive trajectory in my model for weighted proximity that's usually the courses that he ends up playing the best at so 48th in my model and expected proximity here that's better than the 108th over the baseline data that I have. Uh, not quite the high-end numbers that we got at the Fortinet, but also not as far away as you would think it would be there. Like It's kind of very similar answers for when he ended up winning that tournament. I think with Zalatoris, it just comes down to, 
I worry a little bit about the around the green game. Like I, I did put an extra emphasis on around the green and we had seen there for a very short period that he was gaining strokes now all of a sudden around the green, which is kind of always what he does not do. And yeah. now it's slipped back again recently with it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think there's an argument to be made that if this does start creeping into that 15, 16, 17, 18 under sort of range, I think you put out a really good argument about why Zalatoris upside gets capped a little bit. And if there are some concerns, like the proximity numbers are going to look great, but if there are some concerns about his ability to salvage par in some of these situations because of the around the green game, you know, we're comparing him kind of, like I said, it's the, the top five between Scheffler, Clark, the Gala, Zalatoris and Finau is my exact five of my model this week, yeah. which you don't always get that answer. Like I do think my model is very safe in a lot of its outputs with the way that I run it, but you usually get like some, some more extreme outliers than there were this week. Like this was kind of just a board where the five favorites were the legitimate five favorites. And then that's why ownership all of a sudden becomes so important yeah. because uh, there's not that big of a difference between any of them. Like I think in a head to head matchup, if you threw any of them against any of the other ones, you're probably looking somewhere between like minus 130 being the deepest anybody would get to. Scheffler is going to run circles around yeah, any of them when you run numbers there. But <laughs> yeah. um, it's an ownership game for me at the end of the day, which yeah. doesn't necessarily help for this show. But that's something that we can figure out in the next 48 hours. Yeah, exactly. I think um, Darbo mentioning here that he's not a not a fan of what Keith was just saying about the Bermuda it is what it is. You know, in my opinion, I think the wind will be a bit more important. I think it'll keep the scores down. This this has typically been a difficult golf course. You know, I think when when Fina got to minus 16, the, the second place guy was like minus 12, you know, so they still weren't really tearing it up all that well. So I think bogey avoidance definitely more important than birdie rates this week. And less par five scoring, Spencer. Par 70, five par threes this week. So interesting stuff in that situation. Who's your, who's your favorite 9K range, Spencer? Is there is there a guy in this range that's going to shoot the best round of the week? And I'm also curious as to who's going to shoot the worst round of the week. And it's got to be anyone above $8,000. I mean, it's probably a pretty natural answer to say Finau would potentially do it again. Like, he he is the best player in the $9,000 range. I, I think if you were to give me somebody that's a little bit, maybe not off the radar with the percentage, but if I wanted to go a little bit lower... My model loves Steven Yeager every single mm -hmm. week. Like I've been waiting for the Steven Yeager breakout victory for what feels like two years now at this point. And he had the corn fairy success that he had put together and he had a lot of victories there that hasn't necessarily translated. And uh, we've had discussions on this show and there's a lot of discussions that have been had about Yeager just with what his upside actually is. But I know the recent run isn't necessarily what you would want to see with two missed cuts in a 44th, but I thought the third at the Mexico open and the third at the farmers was like the first time that Jaeger actually put himself in the contention to win a golf tournament. And, and then, it, well, yeah. And it didn't go the way that you would want, but sometimes just getting extra reps in when you are in contention can help unless you are Cameron Young, apparently who can't yeah. get across the finish line <laughs> in those situations. But I think Yeager is an extremely talented golfer. He's inside the top five of my model in strokes gain total, strokes gain T to green. Like the, the total aspect of it is the intriguing mm. one because it takes some of the putting into the mix there. He's inside the top five for me in weighted scoring. Like there was just so many metrics with Yeager to where if he pops, he can pop in a really big way. And I thought the all the players that we're talking about, where I thought there was a bunch of overpriced commodities here where like you couldn't really get there. I thought Jaeger at 50 to one markets were still somewhat disrespecting him just because we haven't seen that victory yet. And, and I understand like until you get that win, everybody is incapable of winning, but yeah. sometimes it just takes that one victory at a course like this to where Jaeger now all of a sudden catapults himself into a legitimate top 20 player. <clears throat> well, my, my point I was trying to make when I said, and then was miscut T44 miscut when I've been betting him for top 20 in all three yeah. of those tournaments. Like he was playing such automatic golf and has just completely fallen off the radar since getting to Florida. Yeah. Like maybe it's just fine. Maybe it's time to just leave him alone until, well, we're in Texas now. So maybe, and that's definitely a narrative Spencer is these guys that aren't necessarily like the best in Florida, like for Ryan Palmer, for me, I'll be playing him just, just because I know he likes Florida. I mean, Texas courses. So 
Jesus Christ, he needs to get it together, does Steven Yeager, because I'm going to be going back to him for another top 20. This course suits him so well. He's such a good driver of the golf ball. He's got a good short game. I feel like he should be thriving at this kind of a venue. It's go time. Florida was not good to him at all, Spencer. No, and it was mostly with the putter is what was holding him back there. He lost 1.2 at the players, 3.2 at the API, uh, 3.2 the week before that. So, I mean, like he he didn't – I mean, he lost over a stroke putting each time he was on a Florida course. I, yeah. I think the one thing here inside of my model that I was most intrigued with, like this is one of the categories, and we've talked about this in the past – I am not somebody who necessarily weighs putting as much as a lot of people. I'm usually lower on the putting. I'm trying to find the ball strikers. But one of the things I like to do is I like to take comp, whether it's comp courses or just comp returns that you're getting at similar courses, similar green complexes, any of these overseeded type Bermuda courses, like if I can throw that together and figure out what is your baseline putting and then what is your expected putting for this course. And my model, for the most part, it's like it's kind of why I ended up with Scotty on the API and I laid a seven to one price that I n- normally never would. Yeah. When I can see that increase in my model take place, and all of a sudden it's like, well, the ball striking returns are where you want it to be. It's always the putter that holds a player back. And I've given this answer, I don't even know how many times, Byron, about Steven Yeager, and he usually does not perform. So, like, take this as however you want to take this answer with it. Yeager's not necessarily the most consistent, but. Outside of the top 70 in my model, in expected putting on any generic course on tour, that's an answer that you would expect. He jumped to 38th, 37th, sorry, overall for me on similar courses. So if Steven Yeager can be a top 40 putter at this tournament, yes. now we're having a different conversation where the ball striking can play. Yes, dude. And that's the thing with him. It's always been the putter that's just been letting him down. The ball striking has been too lately, or like you said, it's mainly been the putter actually in Florida. Spencer, for someone to break his cut streak, what, at the Cognizance? Was that where he broke his cut streak? Yeah. It's, and then to go T44, miscut again. It's like, okay, are we, is it a Florida issue? Is it, a, has he lost his game a bit? You know, like, has he lost his confidence? I think it's a Florida thing. I think it's a Florida thing too. Like I understand we're dealing with very similar green complexes there, which is kind of what the negative answer is. Although Florida versus Texas is still going to provide a different sort of a yes. contextual feel, feel to this. Yeah. But if you look at what Jaeger did during those three tournaments, he gained 3.2 off the tee at the Cognizant. He gained 2.6 or 2.8 off the tee at the API, 0.2 at uh, the players. The Some of the approach numbers, like he was average. He pretty much either won two tenths of a unit or lost a half of unit in all three of those appearances. But inside of the top 20 of my model for expected proximity at this course, and then all of a sudden now you throw him into a a completely different region to where I'm hoping that if the putter can be, even if you look Byron, like when he pops with the putter, he has the capabilities. Like that's the one thing I like about him that he actually gained strokes. 4.2 4.2 at the Mexico Big Open, time. 3.4 yeah. at the Sony Open. He gained three at the Wyndham, 2.2 at the John Deere, 2.8 at the Rocket Mortgage. All those finishes when he did that is when he ended up putting together his you know top 15s in a lot of those spots. So um, if the putter yeah. is fine, we're looking at a top 15 sort of player. If the putter's bad, we're going to have to work around that. But I, I, I just think Jaeger is wildly underpriced every single week because – of, I guess, this volatility that he does bring to the table with the putter. Yeah. I think I might just go back to him for a top 40, Spencer. It's plus 180 right now for a top 20. I'd probably buy it at at minus 120 or so for his top 40 rate. It allows that putter to kind of give us a bit of shit and still get away with the bet, you know, whereas if I were to go elsewhere with him, I'd probably bet him like a top 10. You know, I don't know if I'd go anywhere else in between. Um, I'm very bullish on... I've been so freaking bullish on this guy for so... And he's literally gone miscut, T44 miscut, like, since I've gone all in. I think I had him, like, 50% of my lineups at the Cognizant. So, crazy situations, just brutal stuff. So, we'll have to see what he can do moving on from him. Some interesting names, Spencer. We've got Doug Gim, who finally missed missed a top 20 last week. 20% 20 Doug Gim finished T67. Yeah. Um, didn't matter because all the other chalk also missed. So like I, I had 150 lineups go five for six at least. Like it was not a good week for me. Um, but 
I've also had a third of my lineups make it through, you know, like 48 lineups out of 150. So that's just how I roll, which is fun, right? That's, I think, how you you typically play your DFS as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I wasn't going to play Doug Gim at that ownership. What are we doing with Doug Gim this week? I don't know if he's going to be as popular, but I think still quite. What do you think he will get to? I'd probably say at this price, what was he last week in the mid sevens potentially? Or was he like a six? I think he was in the, seven. I want to say he was higher than you think. He might've been in the eights, oh but. Yeah. Okay. Well, either way, I think he's probably going to be about 15% this week. You know, I think people might've soured off of that, you know, we out of the Florida situation, but maybe they go, maybe go back. You know, I think this, this field isn't necessarily the best in the world. Yeah. He so was, what do you think? He was 84 last week. He's 82 okay. this week. Um, in a much worse field. I guess, much, yeah, it is probably much. Ah, uh, it's weird because it's got Scotty, but it doesn't have those other bunch of jabronis that almost the cut. Yeah, I I think it's a decent buyback spot for yeah. Aaron Rye and Doug Gim for this tournament. Yes, um, I, I'm curious to see where ownership lands on those two. As I said, I'm going to be very aggressive on Jaeger, but those were the three for me that I, I liked the best. That Aaron Rye performance was strange. Thought that was a perfect course fit for him. That's, I, I'm not a person that plays Aaron Rye. He very rarely ever makes builds for me. Like I, my model's always lower on him, and he catapulted up into the top 15 play for me last week. Um, it, it just was a disaster. It didn't work out, and he was one of my highest exposed golfers I had, which I I avoided a lot of the chalk that was wrong. But that was when you get as aggressive as I did with him. Unfortunately, that's going to just be the end of the day you got to shoot your shot spence right like that's the thing is if you avoiding all the chalk it's going to be impossible you're not going to make money because they the reason there's chalk is because they're the right place freaking rye bro like all you got to go do is finish 36th that's all we're expecting you to do you know like do your thing i had him as my final leg in my farewell fiver parlay yeah. which was at like 35 to 1 this week well i think you just had to beat like Scott Stallings or someone couldn't do it and shot a disgusting opening round. And he's like round one stuff is typically very good. You know, like that's his best round. So just complete disaster there. But I think it'll be a good bounce back for him. He's so good. Spencer out of the rough. He's like for a guy that doesn't hit in the rough a lot. He's so good out the rough, which to me at this golf course is, is very penal. What would you say a few comp courses are like for this? Like, would you say a little bit of, Tory Pines, would you say a little bit of Murfield Village? Would you say, you know, those like Bay Hill? Yeah, maybe, maybe more on the latter there. Um I I think I think this is a challenging course. Like this is an answer that I talked about in my article this week. And it's a, a unique conversation to be had. Like, let's just take the players that every single year we go to TPC Sawgrass and we play that, and you get this change of it going from uh, a couple months move there and you know all the changes that took into place from March versus or May versus March or whatever the exact uh change was there all of a sudden you go here from November to March you get a completely different course so like I I'm cautiously trying to compare this venue to what we've seen in the past because I don't think it's going to be quite the same tournament that we've gotten over the past three years of playing it there's going to be I think you look at Tom Doak you're always going mm -hmm. to get that same around the green, these runoff areas and everything of the extensive nature that he adds there. That's not going to go away, but I just wonder what ends up taking place with the answers we keep going back to of the wind and the overseeded Bermuda. And that's really not something that we're going to necessarily know until this course plays. And um, that's what makes handicapping sometimes difficult is you're projecting out things to where, or you're trying to extrapolate out data to where, you have a feeling that it's going to go one way, but you always have to be cautious with it because if you overdo it, all of a sudden you're building a model that's not even for the correct tournament. So <laughs> yeah. I, I try to be very, very, very cautious in that. And just talking about, I saw Jim talk about Aaron Rye's mm -hmm. numbers. Like my numbers for him are very similar. I yeah. think I had him I mean, one second. I'll give you the exact totals off the tee. And, um, and I think either distance or accuracy this week is yeah. – you got to have one or the other. You can't be like a mediocre of anything because not hitting it far into the rough is going to be a problem at this golf course. You know, you've got to make sure 
once you're in the rough, you are fighting for pars. And, you know, these runoff areas are going to cause you issues. Yeah, he's he's 102nd for me in distance. He's fourth for driving accuracy. Yeah. Depending on how long you run your numbers for, those numbers will change to a 120 and a first or whatever you end up going to. But mm -hmm. I think for me, the thing that was most enticing is when I ran an expected total driving output, he graded inside the top 20. Um, that's usually what I'm looking for of a golfer to where, you know, it was the Cameron Young answer of last week to where my model consistently likes him more on club down courses. So all of a sudden that inaccuracy that he has off the tee isn't quite as inaccurate on these club down courses. And yeah. Cameron Young was number one in my model for expected total driving. And you don't necessarily think that when you look at him because of the inaccuracy, but I try to be very specific of the course that we're playing. So I, I like that rise distance, even at a really long course, like we're getting this week, it didn't hurt him in the output of the way that I ran it. So um, he hasn't missed back-to-back -back cuts. I want to say since like the early parts of 2023. So oh, wow. Um, nice. it's usually a guy who bounces back after he gives you a poor performance. And I, I don't necessarily think like when things go South for a golfer, they, it's hard to rebound from it sometimes. And, uh, I remember we were talking about your, your little bet that you had on Thursday and Rye just never put the pieces together at any point during the entirety of that round. And all of a sudden at the very end, it just kept getting worse and worse. And obviously when he goes out there on Friday, he's going to need something sp like miraculous to end up making the cut in that position. And yeah. we didn't end up getting that. And unfortunately it's just a miscut weekend. But before that, I mean, he's a golfer that was one of the safer players in my model. Yes. I don't want to get away from that here when I actually think like this is a very good course for, for him once again. Yeah. I would say guys that played last week that played well, no matter what your game is, would, would potentially play well. Yeah. Again, if you've got that, grind a scrappy mentality obviously a bit more distance helps out here a bit more but i think you know we're getting a, a very similar kind of mental approach from these golfers this week spencer where you can say okay it's going to be a grind fest we're not going to go and try and knock a 10 foot and just make a bunch of birdies right it's going to be difficult golf so really quickly too hmm. like what what sweet spot just said in the chat there um that's kind of the point that i think you and i keep bringing up and, and yeah. that's kind of why i think that 15, 16, 18 under par is more of where this is going to go to come into play than these 10 under par tournaments that we're getting. The PGA Tour, they're not even like trying to pretend that they're making it difficult. Every single contest has been yeah. easier than we've ever gotten during these events. So um, when you change the month and now all of a sudden there may not be that bite that you would necessarily expect here. It worries me a little bit that even like inside of my model and I didn't build it so hardcore heavy there are certain factors in it that graded that way but i worry that even maybe i might have graded this in a sense that's a little bit too difficult for what we actually get i think i think the wind's going to help out a bit you know i think we're probably going to land up in the same general area if the wind blows if not because what the wind when the wind blows the course dries out that's you know, the, that's going to be the massive defense Do, have you seen an over under winning score no, because I've been I've been enjoying betting those lately. So I was keeping an eye out because I was gonna I was expecting somewhere around about minus twelve. So what would that be? Two two sixty eight again this week yeah. is what I would probably imagine. Um, it comes out at whichever side. Usually it's found you. I'll I'll take a peek here in the meantime, Spencer. But go ahead and and chat to me about Jake Knapp. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are at this golf course. My model likes Jake Knapp every single week there. Yeah. I mean, the outputs are, I, and I know you've been very aggressive with him also. Um, I had him inside of the top 12 in pretty much all iterations of how I built my model. I, I think there's a little <laughs> bit to be said here about, we talked about this a lot with Eric Cole last season where markets didn't necessarily respect Cole and he kept producing results over and over again. And then the first second Cole gave any reason to show that he wasn't producing results, that he was just an underdog to the whole world. Like he was already an mm -hmm. underdog, but then all of a sudden they got aggressive with it. They weren't as high in their models as maybe you and I were on a guy like Eric Cole. I think there's some of that with Jake Knapp. I know the recent results maybe haven't necessarily been those like Eric Cole sort of results that I'm talking about here with Knapp, but even if you look specifically, the, the 57th at the API, 
One I mean, hole. that's a that's one hole. I mean, he shot it twelve. <laughs> one one yeah. hole. One one ten cut par five, dude. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to really look into that. And then I mean, outside of that, like yeah, the forty fifth at the players. Difficult that's a made course. cut. It's a made cut at a very volatile course. I'm not going to look at that in a negative way for him. So yeah, I, I thought Nap was one of like the four players in that range that I was probably most intrigued to want to see where the ownership landed because I do think that there's playability with him just with the metrics that I'm looking at. Like my model doesn't, I, I try to run things from a regression standpoint in a lot of these situations because I don't want limited data to outweigh my model in the sense to where all of a sudden I have, I'll give a, a random example, like a Jacob Bridgman ends up being number one in my model yeah. or a Jake Knapp ends up being number one. Like I try to run as much regression as I can in these spots and didn't run any regression this week. I kept things how it was just because I wanted to see who really were the names that popped. And it's very simple for me to go through and then try to run some back end regression on it to get rid of certain names. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with Eric Barnes yet, but my model is much higher on Eric Barnes that I assume should be the answer there. But um, we can talk about, yeah, the club down course. I mean, I think that that's a, a good conversation to be had. Yeah. So this is an interesting situation. Weezy's world. Thanks for asking this question. We these kind of questions, you know, they're super simple to me and Spencer. We just mention those kind of words as we go along. If you're just getting new, if you're getting into golf betting, just watching golf for the first time, these are all like nuances. I couldn't say the word um poa anna poa anoa or pas pas palum when I first doing started doing podcasts about this stuff. You know, the, the nuances in golf is is kind of crazy. So ask any dumb question. You know, we they are at some point I was asking the same thing. So a club down course is a golf course that kind of typically requires you to not hit driver as much because force layups. Yeah. Force layups, hitting a driver on a hole where there's, for instance, a Creek that runs across the, the fairway at 290 yards, you know, and you have to cover it by 310 yards to, to cover. It just doesn't make sense to driver. So you're going to hit a three iron or a three wood shorter and, and kind of go that route. So, you know, there's certain courses like Bay Hill that are not club down courses. You're going to hit driver pretty much every time you stand on the tee box, whereas last week was a bit more positional, making sure you get to the right points at dog legs and things like that. Right? Perfect. So, yeah. pretty simple situation this week. It's full send with the driver for the most part, especially on these courses with like thick rough and, and longer holes. So, we'll be looking at guys there. Jake's fun, man. It would be so freaking funny if he stares down Scotty Scheffler and kicks his ass on a Sunday. Imagine Jake Knapp becomes the guy, you know, like the he's got that Camp Smith vibe to him, Spencer. <laughs> you know, I've I've got a decent, I love his game. Yes, it's fun. It's fun, dude. And he just needs a bit of confidence. I mean, he's literally what three or four starts from a win. You know, like the guy needs to like recalibrate his life and just figure out what's going on. He's been playing great golf. So looking forward to seeing him do some good stuff going at going forward this week. Someone that's been really disappointing to me is Thorbjorn Olison. Jeez, dude, I drafted him in my fantasy stuff, Spence, for the season me long. Me too. Just hasn't done it. You know, I think I played him in like 60% of my lineups at Mexico. Like, went from that to like playing him in my like anti-one-and-done cesspool where I made zero dollars off him last week, which is great. You're trying to not win money. So it's it's bad you know not good for him but you seem to be the mckenzie use whisperer spencer seventy eight hundred dollars mckenzie use what kind of mckenzie use can we expect this week I, I don't have the same massive take one way or another there there are certain times inside of my model that it's he's going to be outside the top i've line. never I'm seen a golfer like this spencer where you faded the crap out of it literally killed him in mexico and then you can just be like so on him when he plays well yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, I think my mall has been very accurate on him. I, I yeah. think he's overpriced where he's at right now. So like, if we're talking about, I think he's 7,800 because of this recent run of, he almost wins the Valspar last week. He's going to come into this course with a lot of course history. I understand why people want to play him. I don't necessarily even have a problem with it. I just think he's overpriced because there's a lot of that. Owned. And he's going to be over-owned because of that reason too. So for me, that's not a golfer that I'm going to be playing. Um, he's a fringe top 50 sort of a player that when I ran it for safety became a fringe top 20 sort of a name. That to me is more of like a cash game option than it would be a GPP play. You have bad ownership. You have negative trajectory in my model for upside. Those are the players that I normally will just like, if they beat me in GPPs, they beat me in GPP. So uh, I don't have a massive take though like that. 
Hughes is going to miss the cut or anything like I have on some of these weeks. Yeah, no, you've been incredible with him, dude. It's like when I when I saw you fading him at Mexico and the guy's missing like three foot par putts, it's like one of the best putters on the PGA Tour. I was like, oh, Spence a bet against him. That makes a ton of sense. <laughs> um, okay, Spence, I'm, I was kind of just scrolling through the course history. Yeah, you know, it's only three years. We can't really tell if it's that good a course history or not. But there are not like just if you kind of scroll from call it eighty five hundred dollars all the way down. There's one, one person with a top 10 in three years by the name of Mackenzie Hughes, who's less than $8,500. Then you got to go all the way down to Joel Damon at $7,100 for back-to-back top 10s here. So there's, there's names that are going to be very unowned in this range that in between those two guys, we can chat about one or two in that range, Spencer, and then kind of kick out to Joel Damon and, and tell me what your thoughts are on him with potentially a revitalized he just needed full swing to come out so that he could show the people what he was dealing with and become even more famous and now level up from being a completely atrocious golfer to back to being good at golf again like do the full joel damon spectrum there i think when we look at where ownership is going to land people seem to be at least on monday we'll see where this trends over the next couple days people are very heavy on the course history here and i think you kind of said it best there's three tournaments. Even if you look at the dispersion of scoring between those three events, they have been chaotic in <laughs> yeah. expectation. There was one year where almost 29% of the strokes game came around the green that dipped into, you know, less than 20. The average run of that is about at like 19%, 19 percent, 20%. So um, you haven't necessarily gotten the same tournament year after year after year. Now we're, we keep going back to the same answer. And I don't want to keep beating the, the same answer over and over again into people's heads, but it's like, we do have it at a different time of the year. We do have a different venue. I think the ownership with guys like Mackenzie Hughes guys, like, um, I mean, Alex Smalley, Joel Damon, there's so much ownership right now that's projected to go into those names. Yeah. I would rather just let them beat me. My model was much higher on Mark Hubbard, Thomas Dietrich. Uh, and I, I am kind of weird with Dietrich. There was weeks I've been fading him that yeah. hasn't worked. I haven't really gotten him right. It's probably the opposite answer of Hughes. Like as stout as my model has been on Thomas or on Mackenzie Hughes in the past, I think it's been equally as bad on Thomas Dietrich. So um, I, I don't, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing here, but my model liked him. It liked Ben Griffin. It liked KH Lee. Um, yeah. Hubbard down at 7,000. Like I, I thought there were a lot of really intriguing names to consider. There might be a couple more like, uh, like an Oxshay. Yeah. Silverman. Like there, there's other names to consider in this $7,000 section, but that, that group for me is more where I'd rather go than to get stuck with the ownership. <sighs> Freaking Dietrich was the guy that beat Aaron Rye yeah, in round yeah. one. It was Dietrich. So I love him even more. And I think and Thomas Dietrich's literally been broken the last little while. And he made, I think he made three twos on the par threes. Like just went com- and made zero birdies on the par fives. It was the most random round for me. Okay, Spence. So you kind of like those guys there in the sevens. I don't know. I don't mind Thomas Dietrich off of those courses. The, the same situation with him is so apparent, though, man. Like, avoid him at all costs on Sunday. Do not play Thomas Dietrich in showdown on a Sunday, please. You know, just you got to hope he's far enough up the leaderboard to kind of still cash that top 10 for you just by shooting, losing two strokes to the field on a Sunday and still taking care of business. Okie dokie. Let's get into this range, Spencer. Where is Ryan Palmer? There he is, $6,200. If you take a look at what he's been up to, T26 year and a miscut in the past. Ryan Palmer's like Mr. Texas. I think he's from Texas. And if you take a look at his like Valero and all of those courses, the AT&T Byron Nelson, like he plays really good golf down in Texas. So I'll be looking at him for sure. Freaking Stuart Sink. He shot, he was leading the tournament. Like um, I never watched any golf yesterday, Spencer. And I'm seeing like Stuart Sink finish 33rd. Like, wasn't he like trying to win this tournament at some point last yesterday? So I don't know. Um, we'll have to wait and see what he gets up to. I'll I'll be going back to CT Pan until the wheels fall off. You know, I mean he's he's mispriced in my opinion for what he's been showing us recently. Till he hits another WD or a miscut, I'll I'll be playing him. And even even after that, 
curious about your takes on Camp Champ, who, if you think about this kind of a golf course, you know, it kind of suits his bomber narrative. You know, he can absolutely launch it and play quite nicely at the Valspar last week. Do we see a bit of, are you, you know, like at $6,400 spent, so you're looking for someone that can have some upside at a golf course like this? I get the upside answer, Byron, because we're now down into a range where you're picking and choosing your spots of you're finding one or two narratives of a player that you like, and you're hoping that Cam Champ's distance all of a sudden can propel him to maybe a little greater heights after what we saw at the Valspar with him of finally showing some form again. But I, I think the ownership, I think he's going to be a little bit of po- a little bit popular at least because of that. I don't know exactly where he lands, but I, I'm never a Cam Champ guy. Like I don't love him on these long par 70s, even with the distance. He graded outside the top 120 for me and my model. 118th for expected strokes gain total. Um, the distance and the expected total driving. And I didn't like him last week in, in full transparency and full disclosure of it. And he was great yeah. last week. And the one thing last week is he was fourth for me in expected total driving for that course. He's seventh for me here. So yeah. he does have a weapon that he can at least hold on to. I just worry he's 127th for me in weighted proximity. I, I just have too many red flags. Like I think that there are a lot of guys down in this section that have playability. I think CT pan is one of them. Like I would rather play CT pan. I yeah. would rather play Max Geiserman. I would rather play Chandler Phillips. Like I, I think Chandler Phillips has like a lot of real yeah. deal to his yeah. game with it. Yeah, so um, if I was going to play somebody who's popular, I'd, probably rather play Andrew. Well, not probably. I would rather play Andrew Novak. I don't want to like make it like it's close. Like my <laughs> yeah, model really will. likes Andrew yeah. Novak this week. So, okay. Um, um, no, I guess, you know, I'm not like thrilled about cam champ. And I think if he's going to be 4% owned, I'm out. You know, I was just kind of thinking, catching some lightning in a bottle there out of nowhere, you know, and I, and just think about the long irons that he that's his best range, right? Like he's not a good yeah. wedge player. Yes, yes. This golf course, you know, not a lot of wedges going on. So I'll be looking at him there. Um, all right, rattle off a few other names since you got I think you've got some some confident options down here, Spencer. Uh, well, confident might be an overstatement, Rel- Byron, relatively but confident. Like I think Nate Lashley, if you're shooting for upside at six thousand, mm-hmm. possesses that sort of a, a nature to his game. Um I think Jacob Bridgman, this is a nice bounce back spot for him at 5,500. Just a really weird Thursday where things were kind of going well and then everything fell apart and uh, kind of, you know, just put himself too far out of contention to actually get back into making the cup. But I thought Bridgman was a value last week. My model thinks he's even more of a value now. The stats didn't necessarily decline for him in any sort of the sense there. So, you know, I think like the Bridgman Geiserman. CT Pan, I think you're you're on to something with him. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of options like that is going to be where I'm trying to get a little bit unique and also create some salary savings. I think Nate Lashley, you got to know what you're getting with him. It's a boom or bust option to where when he pops, it's like a top 10. And when he doesn't, he ends up missing the cut. So <laughs> badly, yeah, badly misses the cut. But I, I think I'm fine with that with the price tag we're paying yeah. there. But I mean, Dylan Wu, Chan Kim, Carson Young, um, there's there's a like you already mentioned Ben Silverman, but Ben Silverman, like there's a lot of names down in this section that I think do have playability to them and, and have genuine top 15, 20 upside in this tournament. Absolutely. Well, especially Nate Lashley. The guy's either T 13 ing or missing the cut. Like that's just that's like making a decision and calling it good, you know. Easy peasy situation there. Um, all right, I'll throw a few names out there, Spence. Kevin Doherty, $5,800. He's he's got tons of length off the tee. I don't know, you know, if I'm going to lean into a few... in my model too. Sorry, he has tons of upside in my model. Also. Yeah, yeah, and he's 38th at Mexico, 45th last week. You know, that's not too shabby. Parker Cootie, guys, just refuse to like price this guy correct. I don't know what he's doing in the fives. You know, I mean, what we got a 67th last week, 47th at the Cog, 24th at Mexico. That's three made cuts in a row. Delightful to see that from him. Some other names I kind of mentioned last week was Tom Whitney. He's one of my favorite under the radar guys. I think he's like a Navy or an Army guy. And he he made the cut last week at the Valspar. Another Corn Ferry Tour dude. Alejandro Tosti refuses to put three rounds, at least three rounds of good golf together. It's usually two and a half. 
the other one and a half to one are nightmarish rounds of golf. Like this guy is, he is a blow up, like a ticking time bomb for sure. Someone I don't mind at all though, Spencer, Rafael Campos. To me, I think he's one of the most underrated Corn Ferry Tour players. The guy can strike the crap out of it. He made a holding one, obviously, at the Cognizant or, or the Mexico. Hasn't had any opportunities. And I think this golf course suits his game. So give me Rafael Campos as one of my last few guys in over here. There are, I mean, I'll, I'll name a handful of these guys. I mean, some have more upside than others. Some will be a little bit safer than others. But when I just mm. compare my overall rank compared to what the market on DraftKings is pricing these players, uh, Campos, Bridgman, Kevin Chappell, Brandon Yu, Austin Cook, Nate Lashley, Mac Meisner, Max Geiserman, you mentioned Whitney. Um, those are the like top seven or eight best values that I have on the board for where their price compared to where my model thought they should have been priced. So Let's go. I, like when I'm giving yeah. that answer of, I think that this bottom range has a lot of playability down there. It's that group of names. And when you look at my model, it's very easy to just make a copy of it. And all you have to do is just go to DK versus rank. And you're able to compare it to your ranks when you put the weights into there. And it'll give you that same answer to figure out where your, some of your best values are on the board. But that's, um, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of like all those names there. I think the playability that they possess is a lot better than the price tag that we're seeing right now. Yeah, totally agree. And I'll throw in Sam Bennett, who hasn't shown like he's playing any golf lately. So I'll throw that in as one final name. you got to take a shot at these guys. These are the guys that need to finish 10th for you or 8th or, or God forbid, 5th. You know, like that's the, how you win these GPPs. When someone that's 1% owned, like a Sam Bennett, Parker Cootey, takes care of business for you so we'll wait and see what they get up to spencer what's uh what's going on this week man i know you mentioned did you mention who you bet for those 300 to one bombs uh so my my exact card is i took doug gim at 80 to one maybe there's a lack of upside there I, I still think this is a nice bounce back yeah by an opportunity here at 80 to one took nate lashley at 250 to one like to me, this feels like one of those spots where Lashley really does have win equity. I know like yeah, it doesn't seem does. like it on the surface and he may miss the cut and it's going to be one of those situations where he's in dead last after day one. And I understand that that's a possibility, but I'm shooting for the upside there. Took Andrew Novak at 175 to one. I just think the form that he's bringing in is a much better golfer than should be down in that range. Uh, Geiserman at 250. My model really liked him. Was inside the top 20 actually wow. in every single iteration of how I ran it, and uh, that was an intriguing return. Took Bridgman at 300, and then I am a sucker. I cannot stop betting Steven Yeager. Steven Yeager at 50. I wouldn't be surprised if that drifted maybe a little bit higher because I, I don't think that that's. There are some numbers, Byron, where there's the potential to move a price when things get released. I think everybody's so done with the Jaeger game and hearing oh. you talk about Jaeger that that number is not getting moved anytime <laughs> soon. Hey, dude, I it's those three tournaments. That's if we just forget about them, he should not be fifty to one. If you take those three tournaments away, if you ask me, so I'll be going back to the well there with you, Spencer. Probably betting him T twenty, T forty, whatever they let us do there. So, um, yet to bet Wolves at a Taurus at two thousand plus two thousand. I have a say at the Gala twenty two to one. I don't know if, if I'm going to retire from golf betting in general this week. I just don't feel like I'm at invested whatsoever for some reason. But it's probably going to be one of the better weeks ever, Spencer. That's just usually how it goes. You know, like you don't give a shit and all of a sudden everything goes along just fine. So um, I'll call it. Will's out of Taurus, 20 to 1. Let's go. We're, we're in the mood. Those are my two bets. Willie Z, Seth the Gala, 220 dogs. Let's rock and roll. And aren't they in that Foot Joy ad together? And they're playing down in Texas now? Yeah. Mm, maybe I'm going to have to to take that a little further um, in my sh photoshopping endeavors. So, um, <laughs> all right, Spence, tell the people what's cooking for the rest of the week and where they can find you doing everything and anything under the golf sun. Yeah, a lot of content that we're going to be releasing this week at Rotoballer Byron. So you can find me on Twitter at Tiaf Sports. Uh, I will be talking about this tournament. Why my Vegas report will be out Tuesday, talking about it from a betting perspective. My DraftKings article released earlier today, a lot of the players we talked about, 
You can actually go in this week and get an image of every single player in this field and where I have them ranked. So a lot of deep dive information in this piece this week. If you want to just traverse through that article, see where I have. And then obviously, yes, for free there. Obviously, if you want to get some of the more in-depth personal situations of exactly how I weighed them, which is still has the weights in there. You'll get the top 10 of each one of the categories I ran. But if you want to weigh the, the data yourself, you can jump in. Uh, we have a great premium subscription, your model, Byron, my model, all the premium content that we're very proud of over on the website. And, uh, you know, between us, both the Joes, Ian, Matt Miller, we really, <laughs> this is, that's, you know, this is what's shocking about like breakups <laughs> in life is where I have now moved on and become a Wyndham Clark, like whether Wyndham Clark, I, he's on my card, not on my card, just a lot of love for Wyndham Clark and, uh, J days, rugged you know, Melbourne to the side. I think what upset me the most, cause like I was already like going in that range to kind of move away from Jason day. And then when Clark won, it just moved me fully away. But Melbourne not responding to me as I was trying to get sponsorship (laughs) from them, whether it be for this show or elsewhere and just completely ignoring every single message that I sent them. That was it. Like that was the last straw for me. It was, you know, J day, we've had a good run for the last 10 years. I wish you nothing but the best. It's just going to have to be without me now on it. That, that's a scary proposition, Spencer. I'm not sure we was going to be better off. So hopefully you get the better end of that breakup. You already seem to have had a really good rebound. My my model nice. does like him this week, though. I, I will like just give like a positive. I don't want to make this sound that this is not necessarily <laughs> a Jason Day situation. He's inside of the top 10 for me in all ways I ran. Yeah. He was inside the top five for safety, which I don't know if you think safety and Jason Day with that back, but... No. You know, that's it's, a, that's a different, that's a different discussion to be had. There's not necessary. I don't know what's down in Houston necessarily, but there's not amusement parks that I know of. No, I think he probably just take his family back around the TPC bunny ranch there. Uh, Byron Nelson, just show them. Remember this, this, this before I went and absolutely sucked it up at the PGA championship because I need like 20 days prep to win a tournament. But um, anyway, anyway, <laughs> Kind of getting off a tangent there. Spencer, all still love for Jay Day, though. Um, yeah, you know, it's a sweet spot. I, Wyndham Clark is second in my model also there. So it's a better <laughs> Wyndham Clark performance with that. But uh, I think there is a lot to like about Jason Day. I don't know. Like, I agree. I don't know what there exactly is to do out there in, in Texas. Maybe he can go chill with some of those like Houston rappers, chameleon air or little flip or one of those guys. He needs some, he needs a bit more swagger to get him over the end there. So we'll, if you see Jason day hitting, hitting up a a luxury yacht with some, some uh, underknown rapper, you know, he took the advice of my good friend, Spencer Aguiar and, and, and took advantage of some Texas lifestyle changes. Awesome stuff, folks. Thank you all for tuning in. This is the Rotoballer PGA show for the Texas children's, Houston Open, which is a mouthful that I managed to get right every single time the show. So hit the like button if not for that. And um, don't be shy to subscribe to the show if you're in the mood for that kind of stuff every single week. Catch me at The Model Maniac on X. Um, I'll be providing all my stuff for you guys at Rotoballer this week too. Um, Spencer's got his shows going on for the rest of the week. I've got mine. Catch us at our respective spots over there. We'll catch you guys next week for the Valero. And then I think that is going to be the Masters week thereafter, if I have got my calendar correct. So it's almost the Masters week because the Masters week literally starts a Thursday after the Valero begins. It's just people like releasing articles and stuff like crazy that day. So Awesome stuff, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, Darbo, for being in the chat there and everybody else that kind of popped in there. Weezy knows now what a club down course is. So if you didn't learn anything today, that's what you did learn. So we'll catch you guys next Monday at 9.30 Eastern, every single Monday after Preferred Lines on Rotoballer PGA Show.